this morning about his experience on um, September 11th. And at the end, we might have a few minutes for questions, so we'll do that if we have time. Okay. And I have until 9.25. And then they play the weird music. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I just made your principal. He's uh, he's pretty interesting. Hey. <laughs> thank you. Um. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. It's very, very good. I like the idea that you have the music in between classes. When I went to high school, it wasn't anything like that. And of course, you know, I noticed when I walked in and signed in at your... Uh, office that they had an iPad there or whatever, okay? And I was kidding about the fact that we used to have a chisel and stone when we went to school, you know? That goes to show you how old we are. Um, as Mr. King told you, um, well, first of all, you can tell because you all are from here. You can tell from my lovely southern accent that I'm not from here, okay? Not originally, anyhow. Uh, born and raised in the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And, um, I went to Temple University. I'm sure that most of you are getting ready to graduate. A whole bunch of you are getting ready to go into college, junior college, whatever. Good for you. I guarantee you I don't have anybody in here that's going to Temple University in Philadelphia, right? <laughs> okay, I knew that was almost a safe bet. Well, that's where I went. And I'm so old. I was a radio and television communications major. Um, I'm so old that my dream when I got out of high school was to be a disco DJ. I mean, do you even know what the disco is, okay? Uh, but that was my goal, okay? And um, that didn't work out. My dad was in the insurance industry. His dad was in the insurance industry. And his dad was in the insurance industry. So I basically didn't stand a chance, okay? So uh, it was decided for me, by me, predestined for me to be uh, in the insurance industry. And that's exactly what I did. But it, you know what? It was a good decision for me to make. I've been in the business for 38 years. It's been terrific to me. It's allowed me to uh, have a great life and to be able to ultimately move down to probably what is the greatest state in the union here in North Carolina. I love this place, okay? I'm not leaving. You can't get rid of me no matter what you want to do. Uh, I'm one Yankee that's not going away. Um, the World Trade Center. Um, was basically like a mecca for the insurance industry. So it was not unusual for somebody like myself in that industry to be asked to go to a meeting there. Virtually every insurance organization in the country, probably in the world, had offices there at the trade center. So in August of 2001, a woman by the name of Mary Weeman, this woman was an extremely powerful woman. She had smashed through the glass ceilings of what still exists in our business today. And yeah, ladies, I have three daughters, okay? Believe me, I'm on your side, okay? I am on your side. Um, Mary called me, and she asked me to attend a meeting the following month in New York at the Center. I didn't want to go to her meeting. I wanted to go to another type of insurance meeting that involves aluminum or titanium sticks this long, little metal heads on the end, little white balls in the grass, and you go like this. This was the type of meeting I wanted to attend. Uh, but Mary did to me what every woman has been doing to me since the day I was born. She threw good old-fashioned Catholic guilt down on my head and said, Sure, Joe, I understand. No problem. You don't want to come to my meeting, you know. Um, you know, I'm, nobody from CNA, the company that I worked for at the time, nobody's going to be there. It's okay. Hey, don't you work for the president of the company, Joe? I said, yeah, I do. I report to him directly. And she said, that's great. The next time I see him, I'm going to make sure he understands that you can... And I said, stop. <laughs> stop. I get it. I get it. I'll be there. Okay. I lost my dad uh, four years ago, almost to the day. Uh, but I had the chance to move him from Philadelphia down here. He fell in love with Chatham County. He fell in love with North Carolina. And um, he had a lot of sayings and he had a lot of stories, most of which I can't tell in here, okay? Uh, but the one saying that he did have that I remembered right at the time Mary was harassing me was, plan your work and work your plan. You probably have parents that tell you that. You probably heard that somewhere along in life. But it's a good adage. Plan your work work your plan, okay? I thought I can do that. I can go to her meeting. I can go to the golfing. I can do it. I just got to plan it. So, the Friday before the Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, was on a Tuesday. The Friday before the Tuesday, I went back to Philadelphia from Chicago, where I lived at that time. And uh, 
on that Friday visited with my mom and dad. On Saturday, visited with my sister, something that I still don't do enough of today. And on Sunday, I went to the Philadelphia Eagles, St. Louis Rams, and they were the St. Louis Rams football game. Um, I'm a season ticket holder for the Philadelphia Eagles since 1978. Yeah, 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 I live in North Carolina, right? I'm a season ticket holder for the Philadelphia Eagles. And I still pay for the tickets, and my son and grandson still sit in the seats. Isn't that a great deal for them? What a great deal for them. Um, bank of Dad never closes, okay? Just so you know, okay? The Bank of Dad never closes. Um, and when we came out of the game, my son, who was with me, he's about my height. Uh, but unlike me, he's in great physical shape. He's actually even a little smaller than me, okay? Uh, but in great physical shape. He works for Valero Oil, and he works on the pipelines in South New Jersey, okay? Um, and he's what you would call like a roughneck. Uh, there's an explosion, there's a fire, something goes on out in, uh, on the pipelines. He leads a team out. They go and make sure that they fix the problem, do whatever they have to do to make it, you know, good. That tough work, that rough work makes him think that he's really macho, you know, it, it makes him think that he's really a tough guy. So it's really kind of interesting, we're walking through that parking lot, this kid gives me this big giant hug as we're about halfway through the parking lot, and he, and he whispers in my ear, I miss you dad, and I push back and see a little tear in his eye, and I knew he wasn't crying because of the game. The, the Eagles beat the Rams. Everybody beats the Rams, okay? Um, I, I guess it was a pretense of what was about to occur, and we just didn't know. I got my car, he got his truck, I went down to southern New Jersey to this beautiful uh, golf resort where we were going to have that golf round the next morning. And I woke up the next morning, had some fun, had some fun at lunch. Then we had a real business meeting on Monday afternoon. Yeah, kids, it isn't all fun and games, okay? Uh, and um, on the, uh, after the business meeting, we were going to have a, a dinner. I told the folks at the dinner that I couldn't stay up with them all night long like they like to do because I had a plan. I had to work the plan. If you've ever been to New York, anybody, anybody ever visited New York City? Okay. Anybody come from New York? There you go, okay? This she knows to be true. If you're going to New York, the one thing that you don't want to have to do is drive into New York City. It's brutal. Traffic is just absolutely brutal. I wasn't about to do that myself. I had a plan. My plan was to go back from where I was in Jersey to Philadelphia to Amtrak. Take the train from Philadelphia back up to New York City. That was the way to go. And that's exactly what I did. I got up at 3.30 in the morning. Um, Drove back to Philadelphia, got there about 5.30, bought my round trip ticket for the train. The train pulled in at about 6 a.m. I ran down the steps, took off my suit coat. As a matter of fact, can I do that? You mind? It's hot in here. Um, took off my suit coat, took off my backpack. I don't use a briefcase, I use a backpack. Took out my laptop, turned it on, put it on my laps, got in the train, sat down and did what all of us insurance students do at 6 a.m. in the morning on the Metroliner train on the way to New York with our laptops on, on our laps. I fell asleep. It was 6 a.m. in the morning. I was very, very tired. Off we went on the train. We were about two-thirds of the way up when my cell phone rang. Wow. I am in a room full of people that predominantly don't know life before cell phones. Mm -hmm. They've been in your life since the day you were born, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably were baptized with a phone in your ear, okay? I mean, you know, this is the way life is. Now, for those of us that remember back in the day, there are a few of us that remember back in the day. When you were going on a trip like this, right, you had to have a plan. You had to have it on an itinerary. That itinerary was on a piece of paper. It told you where you were going to be, what meetings you were going to be at, what hotel you were staying at. Okay, what hotel room was, what the phone number was for the hotel so that people could call you. Okay, and then you took this thing called an AT&T long distance card with you because God forbid you had to pay for long distance calls back in the day. Okay, it was brutal. Now you have, you know, national plans, international plans. You call India today for nothing. Okay, this wasn't the way it was, but back in the day you had to have a plan. With cell phones, Wherever you are, that's where you'll be, except here 
in this high school because I know this is no freaking service here, okay? <laughs> but wherever you are, that's where you will be, okay? Just hit me up with a cell phone, right? That's all you need. Just hit me up with a cell phone. Um, it wasn't a whole lot different in 2001. Cell phones were all great, okay? And everybody basically was having it. So before this trip, I had said to my wife, listen, I got a meeting in New York on Tuesday. I'm going to go back to Philly, visit with the family, go to the game with Joe, have a meeting on Tuesday in New York. I'll be back Tuesday night. Love you. That's basically all I told my wife. No plans, no itineraries, no big lists. You think I forgot where I was in the story. I was on the train asleep with my laptop on, okay? And the phone, the cell phone rang, and I picked it up, and I very groggily said, good morning. And it was my wife, and she said, I'm very sorry. Didn't mean to wake you up. I said, no, that's okay. Train's about ready to pull into Newark, and i got to get off. And she said, Newark, I thought you said you were going to New York. And I said, yeah, yeah, but it's a lot easier to get to the World Trade Center if you take the PATH train from Newark because it stops right underneath the World Trade Center. So I'm going to get off. And so that morning, I told my wife exactly where I was going, where I was going to be. I got off that train dutifully with thousands of other New Yorker, uh, New Jerseyans and New Yorkers, and got onto the PATH train and made my way into the World Trade Center. And when we got to the South Tower, the building that I was in, um, the security people were absolutely incredible. They seemed to know who belonged in those buildings simply by looking at your face. Nothing more. Just looking at your face. Do you know that in that building, there were, at any point in time, as many as 25,000 people? Both buildings. So you're talking 50,000 total. And yet these people seemed to know who to belong and who didn't belong. There was a bombing in 1993 at the Trade Center. So the 9-11 event wasn't the first event there, okay? So there was a bombing in, 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 in 93, and so I'm sure that's what made those security people so, so good and on top of their game for that time. So I walked in the building, the guy looked at me immediately, he saw that I didn't belong, gives me a little wiggly finger, I go over to the security desk. And he took my picture electronically. He transferred that picture onto a little white card, and on that card was my name, the company that I was going to visit, Aon Corporation, the floor that I was going to, 105, how long the card was good for, it was good until 9-12-2001, and a barcode. And the barcode was the most important thing on the card, not just because it contained all that equipment that I just mentioned electronically, but that also was the way that you would swipe your way through the electronic turnstiles that separated you from the elevators in the building. Both buildings were identical. Both buildings were 110 stories high. The 110th floor in the North Tower was the Windows of the World restaurant. Unfortunately, that was open that morning. The 110th and the 107th floor in the South Tower, the building that I was in, they were observation decks. Thank God it was too early. They were not open that morning. Okay? The other floors that I didn't mention about 105 in both buildings, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, elevator equipment, elevator cabling, no human beings. We were going up to 105, the highest occupied level of the South Tower at that time. When we got through the turnstiles, you had your choice of elevator, banks of elevators that you had to go to. I went to the one that was at the far left. It went on an express basis to the 78th floor. At that 78th floor, same as on the 44th floor in both buildings, but at that 78th floor was what was known as a sky lobby. Each of the buildings had three lobbies, one at the ground, one at the 44th floor, one at the 78th floor. You can't build elevators that go up 110 straight floors. It's not possible. It's not an engineering possibility. You're all probably smarter than me and probably already knew that. Um, but, so these were built so that you had three lobbies. We went up to 78 the highest sky lobby level, and switched off onto a bank of elevators that took us up to 105. And when we got there, there were, and the elevator doors opened up, Mary Weeman, the woman that I had mentioned earlier, that had shamed me into being at this meeting, and there she was. She's standing in front of us, and it was kind of an interesting moment because 
There she is, and she's got a spray bottle of Murphy's oil soap in one hand and a rag in the other. She's not Susie Helmaker by any stretch of the imagination, okay? But this was how important the meeting was to her. She wanted everything perfect in the enclosed conference room that she was about to take us to, right down to the furniture which she was polishing. This was important to her. She escorted us into that conference room. That conference room was probably about just a little smaller than the classroom we're in here today. But unlike this classroom, four walls, no windows, one door. The meeting was supposed to commence at 8.30. If you get into the insurance industry, one of the things is if, if you're always late, you'll like the insurance industry because there's never any meeting that starts on time. This day was no different. 8.30 came and went, people drinking Starbucks and talking about kids and soccer and football and whatever, okay? And at 8.48, the lights flicker. That's it. Just a flicker of lights. We couldn't see anything. We couldn't hear anything. We didn't feel anything. Just this flicker of lights. Almost immediately, a guy by the name of Rick Blood from the AM Corporation bowed into the room and he said, Hey, there's been an explosion in the North Tower. we got to evacuate. 54 intelligent human beings all did the same thing at the same time. Looked at poor Rick and said, hey man, it's New York, stuff happens. Wasn't the word we used. Stuff happens, let us have our meeting. And he looked at us and he said, man, you don't understand. I'm a volunteer fire marshal for 105, 104, 103. I can't leave until all of you leave. We got to leave. Um, and I know he got everybody out of that room that day because I was the last guy out. He took us all to the nearest fire stairwell on 105. And that's where he proceeded to tell us that we were now going to walk down 105 flights of steps. Oh yeah, what a bunch of happy campers, okay? Everybody did the same thing. They reached into their pocket or to their phone or to their, or to their hips or whatever. I gave away the line. And pulled out their cell phone. <coughs> this was back in the day and age when everybody had a flip phone. Mm -hmm. Any of you have a flip phone? Shame on you, okay? But, Everybody's got a smartphone now, right? But back in the day with the flip phones, you'd flip them up, you'd look at the screen, something interesting, no service, no service, no service. The main cell tower for all of southern Manhattan was on top of the North Tower, the first building to be hit. And, you know, we were all smart. We thought, okay, maybe we could get on a regular phone, a landline. You all know what a landline is? Yeah, that's good, okay. Um, Good idea, except that, think about this, everybody in New York City is now on those landlines calling their mom, dad, sister, brother, aunt, uncle to make sure that they're okay. And even more incredibly, everybody in the world, that's not a stretch, folks, everybody in the world that knows somebody in New York City is now calling in on those landlines to find out whether mom, dad, sister, brother, aunt, uncle are okay. Cell service was interrupted. Landlines couldn't handle all the communication <coughs> traffic. I understand that there are some of you that are on their way to the armed services in here. Where are they? To the service? Nobody? Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're going to find this out. One of the things that you do know, one of the things that those of us that did serve know, is when you attack the enemy, one of the first things you do is cut the lines of communication. That's exactly what happened that day. Whether it was winning or unwitting, all the lines of communication were cut. So now you got this group of 54 type A personalities that can't even communicate with anybody on their cell phones, and they're doubly nicked off about what's going on. And I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, well, didn't you know what was going on? And that's exactly the point. Everyone else in the world, you weren't quite old enough to actually remember, but virtually everyone else in the world knew exactly what was going on outside and inside those buildings that any of us that were right there. We had no clue. We started to make our way down the steps. We got down to the 90th floor. The fire uh, stairwell door on the 90th floor was in a position it wasn't supposed to be. Open. Okay, it was propped open. I'm in the fire insurance business, and I know better than to get out of a fire stairwell, right? Wrong. When your parents tell you you're absolutely positively not going to do something, what do you usually do? Yeah, 
Yeah, okay, come on, tell the truth, right? Okay, same thing. Same event, and I'm 45. I walk out onto the 90th floor. I don't know whether I gotta get to another fire stairwell, whatever. That's though where I experienced the worst 30, 40 seconds of my life. To look out those windows to the north, to see these gaping black holes through the sides of that other building. Gray and black billows of smoke pouring out of those holes, flames redder than any red I'd ever seen before in my life, licking up the side of the building and beyond the roof level. And it was a beautiful crystal clear day that day in, in, in September in New York City. And I remember being able to see clearly through that smoke, through that fire, into those huge black holes and seeing the fuselage of a large plane lodged inside the other building. And I, immediately thought to myself, my God, how did the pilot not see the building? How did he miss the building? And the fact of the matter was, he didn't miss. He didn't miss. You see all that, you see furniture, paper, people being pulled out of the building against their will. It was an incredible, awesome, gruesome sight. And I was so afraid. I knew it wasn't an Xbox game. I knew it wasn't a made-for-TV movie. I knew this was reality. I just wanted to leave. People were on that floor frozen, whether they were frozen in fear, mesmerized by what they saw, screaming at the top of their lungs, and yet they couldn't seem to move. I, I had to get out. I turned to leave. One of the guys that was in the meeting with me, Lud Carroll from Zurich Insurance Company, he's behind me, and he's this huge human being, played middle linebacker at University of Pittsburgh. I almost knocked him over with my stubby little body because I was in such a hurry. And he looked at me, and he grabbed me, and he put his hands on my shoulders. He said, what are you going to do, man? I said, I'm getting the heck out of here. What are you going to do? And he looked at me, and he said, you know what? That's a really, really good idea. But before I go, um, I'm going to go. And he pointed to the closest men's room. That simple decision to use the restroom, that simple delay in his departure cost him his life that day. Simple delay. I got to the top of the fire stairwell door. Uh, they're making an announcement. The event's been contained to the North Tower. The South Tower is considered safe. If you work in the South Tower, we suggest you return to your workstation. If you are a visitor, we suggest that you stay where you are until further notice. If you feel you need to leave, please proceed with caution. Doesn't sound logical, right? But it made tons of sense. There's a woman or man in charge of building security somewhere on the ground level of that building at that point. You know there's a cop and a firefighter on either side. They're looking at this person saying, there are as many as 25,000 people in your building. We can't let them outside. It's raining concrete, steel, and bodies. What are you going to do? And I'm sure this person thought to themselves, elevators are going up and down, electricity's on, ventilation system's working. Let's just wait and see what's going on. Who would have ever thought that within 18 minutes the same exact thing would happen to our building? I was leaving. I wasn't hesitating. I didn't know how careful I was going to be. I got down to 78, that sky lobby level that I mentioned before. Mary Weeman, the woman that I've mentioned several times, she's screaming for me to go to the elevator. And finally, my pea brain, my common, my common sense finally hit me and I thought to myself, you know what? I don't think I should get in an elevator. Building, state of duress, fire. Mm, stay out of the elevator. Yeah, I know it's not my building. Uh, I'm not going. And I turned and I went back to the stairwell. Arguably the best decision I've made in what is still my life. Because I was somewhere between the 74th and the 72nd floor when the plane, the second plane, plowed through our building. That plane went through our building between floors 78 and 82 on an angle. We were just a few short stories below the strike zone. Never felt anything like that. Never want to ever feel anything like that again. This concrete bunker, this fire stairwell that we're inside starts to shake so violently from side to side. I'm not an engineer. I can't tell you angles. But it's shaking at angles it should be shaking. The concrete splattering out, the handrails breaking away from the wall. The steps literally like waves in the ocean undulating, undulating underneath our feet. And we feel this heat ball blowing by us. We smell this jet fuel. And this thing's just rocking back and forth, back and forth. It feels like forever. Maybe it was seconds, maybe a minute. And it finally stops. 
and settles, and you would think that there would be this craziness, this massive pandemonium. And yet in that stairwell, there was nothing, nothing but a stunned, stunned silence. We all tried to grab for our cell phones again. Thank God they weren't working. Because at that particular point in time, ignorance truly was bliss. What we didn't know couldn't hurt us. So we started to make our way down the steps. I'll tell you, some funny observations on the way down those steps. For instance, at one place and one time, I have never seen so many pairs of women's shoes. Now you think about it, you're 70 flights of steps above ground, you're in three or four inch heels, like they say in New York, forget about it. A lot of barefooted women that day, okay? If you wanted a new laptop computer, boom, that was your day, okay? More electronic equipment ditched inside that fire stairwell than an old bankrupt <coughs> appliance store. I mean, backpacks, overcoats, briefcases, bags of food, you name it. Everything just ditched to the side. But we were fine. Two, three, four people wide. If anything was in our way, you kicked it out of the way, and we're all heading in the same direction until the 35th. That's, that's the chance we had for the first time to encounter the police, the firefighters, and the paramedics from New York City and the Port Authority. You ever have that situation where you look at somebody and they look back at you and you look into each other's eyes, you never say a word and yet the whole story gets told, right? We had that moment. Just the looks in their eyes told the story. Just the looks in their eyes. They knew. They knew. they knew that they were going up those steps to try to fight a fire that they couldn't beat. They knew that they were going up those steps to try to save lives that they couldn't save. They knew that they were marching into the bowels of hell. And they knew that they were going up. And they knew that they were never, never coming back. Let me ask you, could you be that brave? Could you be that strong? Right at that same time, there was a guy walking along with us, maintenance guy from the building. Had a name tag over his pocket, I never got his name. He was carrying with him one of the most annoying inventions God ever allowed us to create. The next telephone with the walkie-talkie feature, okay? And this thing had been incredibly quiet the entire time he was walking along with us. All of a sudden, this thing starts to belch, beat, make all kinds of noise, and we hear this voice scream out, we're on 82, we can't get down, we don't know what we're going to do. And this kid, he stops, he's not much older than you guys, he stops dead in his tracks, spins on the balls of his feet. He's to my left, I looked at him, I said, where are you going to go, man, what are you going to do? And he looked at me and he said, you know, I don't know but I'm going to save my friend. I submit to you, that name was maintenance man. That is a true American hero. That man who was willing to lay down his life to save that of a friend. I can only hope the cops and the firefighters in that building turned him around that day and made him leave. When we got down to the lobby level of the building, they couldn't let us out on the street. You're looking out at crumbled concrete, twisted steel, Red blotches on the ground, and you knew what those red blotches were. They made us go down into the underground, the concourse level of those uh, buildings in that plaza. And you're in this underground that's a rat maze of corridors. Every store known to, to the mankind, like the biggest mall of all, in all the world, underground, okay? Signs that mean nothing to you unless you're from New York. One, two, three, four, red, blue, green, yellow. I mean, you have no idea where you're supposed to be going, right? We're seeing people that are really hurt by the event. People with missing limbs, gaping wounds, true blood and gut stuff. Your human nature makes you want to reach out and try to help. You could. There were so many cops, firefighters, police there that day to help those people. I've never seen such an outpouring of caring, of concern, of love. And that's what that was that day. This total outpouring of love. So the people that needed help were getting the help they needed. Those of us that were okay, we're on our own. The herd mentality takes over. I hear a guy at the front of my herd say, we want to get to the northeastern end of the complex. It's the furthest away from the buildings. My internal GPS said, sounds good to me. We followed him. 
we start winding our way through that underground uh, set of quarters. We're about ready to make our final left. There it is. Starbucks. And it's open. And there are people in line. I kid you not, okay? I'm a card-carrying member of the Starbucks nation, okay? But I don't know how much double, triple, whatever the heck it is people do. It just goes to show you that not even in the greatest of moments, the greatest minds are where they need to be. We got to the farthest end of that complex. We go up the escalators that are no longer escalating. They are plowing back everything. I mean everything. It's grotesque. Uh, with these bobcat bulldozers. They're screaming at us, don't stop, don't stop, run, run, run. You get across the street in front of Trinity Church, and you have what you would call a Sodom and Gomorrah moment. You stop, you turn around, and you look at this unbelievable sight, the sticker tape of concrete, steel, and bodies. On the way out, I was fortunate enough to run into a friend of mine, David Duffy. He's a guy that I work with all the time in New York. He was in the building. We met together. It was fate. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I'm supposed to get on a train, go back to Philly, get in a rental car, drive to the Philly airport, fly back to Chicago. I don't think that's going to happen. He said, you know what? My wife works on the 40th floor of the North Tower. I haven't heard from her. I want to get home, make sure she's okay. Why don't you come with me? I said, sure. Where do you live? And he said, Upper West Side. Uh, 111th Street. I went, wow, that's a long way away. He said, you got something better to do? And I said, no, no, okay, let's go. We were only eight blocks north of the building. Eight minutes. Commercial laundry. Doors thrown wide open. WINS, the all-news radio station, blaring out this was an all-purpose terrorist attack. Our jaws just dropped to the ground. Not here, this can't happen here. But it was the next couple of sounds that are the ones that haunt us every day. The sound of the twisting steel and crumbling concrete of what once was the north, the south tower, the building that we had been in just eight minutes prior, coming to the ground. Even more hauntingly, the sound of millions of New Yorkers all screaming the same blood curdling scream, all at the same time. We were able to get into a friend of David's flat in the Tribeca section of the city, tried to make some sense of what was going on by watching the TV, about five hours in, one of the true American heroes of that day, the, the, the mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, he got on the TV and he started to talk. And one of the things he said was, I know everybody just wants to go home. Go look at the pictures, guys. Pictures of people walking across the George Washington Bridge into New Jersey, walking out the Long Island Expressway and the Long Island Railroad onto the Long Island. They had shut all forms of transportation down. The only thing you could do was walk. And Giuliani understood that everybody just wanted to get home. That's all he wanted to do, get home. And my buddy David, who was with me, said, come on, we're going. I said, where? He said, to the subway. We're going back to my place. I said, wow, Midtown Manhattan, you know, Empire State Building. Maybe it's the next target. We didn't know. But we went. We got on a subway. We were only two blocks up. Two st stops off, pardon me, and there's 32nd Street Amtrak. The way I got in, the way that I wanted to get out, even if it was just a Philly. We both got out of the train together, didn't talk to each other. There's a woman from Amtrak, she sees me because we look like tourists, and she says, Where are you going, honey? I said, I need to get to Philadelphia. And she says, Great, there's a train down here about to take off. And I reached into my pocket to give her my return ticket. I had a round trip ticket, and she looked at me, she said, You can, sweetie, we're not collecting tickets today. Some things never change in New York, okay? So, I mean, you know, I got down in the train, you go underneath the Hudson River, you come up on the Jersey side, you look back at what was once the greatest skyline in all the world, now relegated to a gray and black cloud. Eighty minutes on the train, people crammed in, sitting, standing. Not a word was spoke. No words to say. When I got down to Philly, got out of the train, got into a rental car, I had gold, I had a car. And I was going to make my trip up to my parents' house in Northeast Philadelphia. I wasn't going to drive back to Illinois that day. Uh, and when I got there, my mom was waiting for me. I promise you, I'm not going to cry right now, okay? Because I usually always do. But I'm going to be tough for the macho men here at Chatham Central. <laughs> um, but let me tell you something. Love your mothers. Guys. 
love your mothers. There's my mom. She comes down off the steps, gives me a big giant hug. Pats my head, sobs, my baby, my baby. Didn't have the heart to remind her that I was the oldest one. <laughs> and uh, my mom did for me at that moment what my mom continues to do for me to this day. Yeah, my mom's still alive. She helped, she helped me and she loved me. And that's what I needed with my mom this morning. When I got up the next morning, I called the office to let them know that I wasn't going to be in. It was a good thing because they thought I was dead. And I made the 14 and a half hour trip back to Aurora, Illinois in about 11 and a half hours. So if you're going to be law enforcement, I apologize in advance. I just wanted to get home. And when I got home, my wife had called me and said that they were going to have a mass at our local church. And I said, it's a good place to be. And when I got to the church and I opened the back doors of that church, I don't know whether I was more afraid then or the day before to see those hundreds of pairs of eyes staring back at me. But when I looked over to the right, the pew where we always sit, the Roman Catholics, we always sit in the same pew, okay? There's my wife, a couple of my kids, some friends. My wife, who is a very non-demonstrative person, jumps over the back of the pew, runs to the back of the church, gives me the greatest hug and a kiss a man could ever want. I knew at that moment, I was Man, I did it before the music started, so I'm really happy I was able to tell the whole story about the trip and leave you no time to ask me any questions. But can I, can I tell you something? Really, seriously, something. You're in the midst of watching a presidential election. I am not political about this, and I'm not political about anything. Okay? But you're in the midst of a presidential election and a change in human spirit here in the United States. Okay. But the one thing that they, the, the candidates have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt is that our generation hasn't done such a good job with stuff. We really haven't. And when I look at you, you need to understand, you are our future. It's hard to hear, it's hard to say. You're our future. And we are counting on you. We're counting on you to do it better than we have done, to make it better than we have made it. Give this a better world. And just remember one thing, really, really important. Everybody, everybody in this room loves you. They love you. And they need your help. So go to your next class. Be good. Be strong. And I hope you take some of the story with you. Thanks.